Well, good morning. As was mentioned, uh, my name is Pastor Tim Keith from Visalia, California. Um, I've been here a handful of times, but it's been probably a year and a half or so, I would, I would guess. So since then, we had our, our third baby, a little girl was born in, um, on March 20, which was the, that's our time marker for COVID. That was the first Sunday that we didn't gather for worship. So we were pretty isolated. A little, little baby at home, not doing very much. Uh, but the family's all doing really well. Uh, but it's good for, for me. I'm glad to be able to come join you again uh, this morning for worship. We're looking at Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, uh, as given to the people of Israel. So if you have a, have a Bible and would like to turn there, we'll be reading Exodus 20, verses 1 through 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear, and they stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Amen. I noticed something um, strange as a as a parent, and it's something that you may have noticed if you're a parent or even yourself as a as a as when you were a kid. And it's it's simple, really, but it struck me recently. And it's that my kids are not better off when I just let them do whatever it is that they want to do. And it's, it's with simple things, like if there's a Saturday, a day at home, where uh, my daughter, the oldest one, will ask, like, hey, Dad, what are we going to do today? And I, if I were to say, anything you want to do, anything you want to do today, that's actually not going to be that good of a day for, for any of us, really. She does much better if there's some sort of structure or, or guidance. She'll, be, she'll wind up being bored and whiny if I just say anything. Do whatever you want. But if I say something like, well, we could go ride bikes in the park, or we could build some Legos, or we could do a craft. Like, that's going to be a better day. She, she thrives within structure and some direction with what to do with that day. And left entirely to themselves, if you were to leave kids, little children to themselves, uh, they will enslave themselves with things like horrible eating habits, um, really bad sleep routines and bedtimes, um, Horrible uh, ways of even interacting with one another. Endless hours of, of TV or, or video games or whatever else. They'll make themselves mis miserable. And if you left a child completely alone, really, they would never actually learn to even relate to another person because they need that sort of guidance. They need that sort of direction. They need boundaries. Because they just don't know yet, as little children, they really don't know what will actually help them versus what's actually just going to hurt them in their life. Now, we live in a world today that values freedom to the nth degree. It values freedom almost above, above anything else. 
But a problem arises if we elevate freedom from everything to the highest value. And we make freedom from everything the most important thing in our life. This is what's called absolute negative freedom. Absolute negative freedom. This is the idea, again, that you're free from anything and everything. No one can really tell you what to do or how to live your life. No one can make you act a certain way. But this will lead to a society, again, as James Taylor put it, in which the only sin which is not tolerated is intolerance. If you take freedom from everything, you can't make me do anything. The only sin is if you are not tolerant. But is such a framework actually tenable? Can we have, actually live in such a way? Is it really even freedom to live such a way? Or to put it differently, does real freedom actually have a direction? Does it have a goal? Is there a difference between freedom from something and freedom to something? Does real freedom have a direction? Now the book of Exodus, which we've read from this morning, it tells the story of the development of the nation of Israel. And it begins with Moses being drawn out of the Nile. And there's some birth imagery in that story. And the nation of Israel is called the firstborn of God. God calls Israel the firstborn of God when he's warning Pharaoh about whether or not he's going to release them from slavery. Israel's in a difficult place in slavery to Egypt. And eventually, you know the story, they're, they're let, let go after all of these plagues. But as they're leaving, uh, Pharaoh changes his mind and chases them, meets them at the Red Sea. And God does this miraculous thing, right? He parts the Red Sea. And the nation of Israel walk through and they're, they're saved by going through these waters. And later on in the scriptures, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul calls that event Israel's baptism. They were baptized when they walked through the waters and they're saved from, from Egypt. And so this is the firstborn nation of God, the firstborn of God. They've been baptized. And now what we read this morning, there's this ceremony that takes place in Exodus 20. And really, it continues on for a few more chapters. Something like a coming-of-age ceremony for this, this really young, this really new nation. This people of God. They're born, again, the firstborn of God. They've been baptized. And now there's like this, this ceremony that they have. And their relationship with God is actually formalized for the first time. And that's what really took place on Mount Sinai here. In Exodus 20 and again, those following chapters. And it might not be something that is so clear and obvious to us. But it was clear to Israel what was happening. That God was establishing a covenant with his people. And there was a certain type of covenant that was common. It's called a suzerain vassal covenant. Now, a suzerain vassal agreement, it was relatively common in the ancient Near East as a way of establishing treaties between certain nations. The way it would work is two nations that were not equal in size and in strength would enter into this sort of relationship. And the larger nation, the king from that large nation, that's called the suzerain, they would take over all the formal ownership of the smaller nation, the vassal, all of their land and all of the production, and even, uh, even in terms of their own military. So the suzerain would, would get all the production from, from the land and things like that and could say, hey, we're going to war, or I'm being attacked, you come join me, your military must join me. And the vassal was obligated to, to oblige. They would pay tribute, that sort of thing. But in return, the vassal also got a few benefits. For one, they weren't simply destroyed. Right? The larger nation could come in and just wipe them out. But instead, they get to exist, and often they had sort of their own uh, culture could sort of be retained. Even some of their own leadership structures within their nation could, could still exist, and traditions could carry on. And they would, they would have to make these payments and stuff like that. But they also had the benefit of this bigger power, this army, larger army, that they could call on. And the, the suzerain was obligated to help defend the vassal if they were ever attacked. And this is the sort of agreement that's being set up. This is the sort of ceremony that's happening in Exodus chapter 20. Now the linchpin of these sorts of treaties was loyalty. You had to be loyal to this covenant. Covenant faithfulness was the most important thing. Because really what a treaty like this is doing, it's saying, 
let us pretend, let us act as if we're family. We're going to enter into a relationship as if we're family, and we are obligated, we have responsibility toward one another. And in any family relationship, the closer related you are, the higher the obligations, right? The higher the responsibilities, the more loyalty and faithfulness you have to that person in your family. And so nations would put together a covenant and say, let's, let's treat one another as if we're family. I promise that we've got one another's backs in these situations. And so if you remember what Israel was called by God, the, the firstborn, the firstborn child of God, this indicates a pretty close familial relationship. So there's a high level of covenant faithfulness and loyalty required here because this is a strong bond that's being referenced here. And that's what this whole thing was. That's what this whole law was. It's a covenant that would establish the nature of the relationship between Israel, this brand new people, and their God. So the covenant, the law, these Ten Commandments, really, it's a covenant of grace, and it's a covenant of love that God gave, where he said at the beginning, those opening words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt. In other words, he's saying, I am the suzerain, and you are my vassal. This is the way that most covenants of these sorts were introduced, with the work that the king, the suzerain, had done. And so God says, I am your God who's brought you up out of Egypt. Because he freed these people. Right? He freed them from slavery. And he freed them towards something better. He didn't just free them from bondage and slavery. He delivered them into something better. Because imagine the situation. Try to, try to envision. Imagine a situation where something like 2 million people, which is the size of the, the nation of Israel when they left Egypt, 2 million people wander out of Egypt and into the desert, and they're told, you're free to live in the desert. What sort of freedom is that, right? And then they were just left out there with no direction, no, no place to go, no land that's their own, no order or structure or anything like that. You just imagine the chaos that would ensue with some 2 million people wandering around like, okay, what, what are we supposed to do now? Some sort of hierarchy of dominance would develop within that group of people. Some sort of system would be established. Self-interest would take over, undoubtedly, in a total vacuum of, of leadership and, and a hierarchy. There would be some sort of person who would rise up who would use other people. They'd be used and abused. And this would not be long before the people of Israel would be enslaved once again. But this time it would just be to themselves, rather than to the Egyptians. And so God provided something for them. He gave them this gift. He gave them a law to govern them. And the law that he gave, it's a unique law. It's unique because it's only for God's people. But when God gave the law to Israel, it wasn't simply so that they could live in such a way that other people would look at them and, and just want to copy the way that they lived their lives. It wasn't just to give the world a, a picture of what a better way of living uh, life would be. In other words, it's not as if God looked upon the, the earth and saw, and these, these humans have just not figured out how to live life. It looks really tough, so let me just give you a cheat code. You live this way, and it will be better, and everyone else can see that, and then you guys go on your marriage. That was not the purpose of the law. The primary motivation in the background here was redeeming love for his own people. Because it was for freedom that Israel had been set free. They'd been set free to go live in real freedom. Not to enslave themselves once more. And so God gave them a law so that they could continue living the free life. Because people are only free in the right environment. And this is true of anything. A fish is only free in the water. It needs a certain environment, right? A bird is free if it's allowed to be in the air, flying around. God's people would only remain free in their proper element 
which would be having a, a proper way of relating with one another and relating with their God. So they would only be truly free within God's law. They didn't need to uh, destroy themselves or harm themselves by reenacting the, the oppressive rule that they had learned through the Egyptians and through the Canaanites. This new way with God's law, this was the way to live at peace with God and to live at peace with one another around them. But doing so, it would require each person to take this covenant responsibility to heart. It would require them each to take this law to heart on an individual basis. Now the commandments as they're given to us here, they're given in the a second person singular, which in English we only have one word for you, and it can be plural, right? I can stop you to all of you, to you, or it can be to you. You. In most other languages, there's a way to differentiate that, and in Hebrew, there is. And this, we know, is absolutely individual. These laws are spoken to each person who's a part of Israel. And so you will not covet. You shall not murder. You will not commit adultery. You will not steal. Each person must hear that law and take it for themselves as an individual person. Each person must do this. And if they would, if each person would own that law, Israel would be a beautiful, healthy, stabilizing environment for so many. It would be a light to the nations. Because who wouldn't want to live in a community where where authorities are, are respected and, and they lead honorably, and where people are trustworthy and honest, you don't need to fear for uh, your own life or even for your own possessions. Because people are each content with what they have, not coveting or wanting anything from others. Who wouldn't want to live in a place where people saw their, themselves as a vital part, an integral part of this bigger community in which they recognized the way that their own individual and personal actions had this profound and widespread impact on the whole group. And so each person faithfully honored the covenant and took covenant loyalty seriously. And this we could say would be true for us living today as well, right? How wonderful would our world be if we kept God's covenant perfectly? Imagine our church community. How wonderful would this place be if each of us could perfectly obey these laws that God gave to his people to the fullest extent and we kept covenant faithfulness with him? But unfortunately, we're just like Israel was. And they failed regularly. They did not keep covenant faithfulness with their God. Not even close. And so often, neither do we. We're often like those Israelites who kind of look around at one another and say, why don't we just go back to Egypt? Like, there was pretty good food there, really. There was water every day. You didn't have to think about what you were going to do because you, you were going to get told what you were going to do. Sometimes we prefer slavery to God's freedom. Our hearts are like the, the little kid who really can't see what's truly good for him. So he refuses to go to sleep when the parent's like, you need to sleep, you're exhausted. And he refuses or refuses to eat healthy food, only eats junk food and wonders why it doesn't feel very good. We're like addicts who just return back to their vice even as it kills them. So when we're uh, offended or if we've been hurt by someone, it feels good often to sort of nurse that anger a little bit, to dwell on it. There's a certain vigor in fanning the flame of our own anger. It feels like power and it feels like control. And it quickly can grow to hatred or even into <clears throat> slander. Which again, the release of that hatred, it's somewhat satisfying. It feels a little bit like the rush 
of a drug to sort of just vent angrily, to spew out hateful or angry words, and at the end of it, we're like, ha! I showed them, didn't I? But really, we're not released from our anger or from our hate simply by expressing it in such a way. It continues to enslave us. It dominates our mind. We can't think about that person or that place or that event where that thing happened without our chest just involuntarily tightening up. And so what we thought we wanted, that ends up enslaving us. Or we might tell lies or half-truths. Sometimes we exaggerate, we take credit for things that's not ours. Uh, we undermine other people and we might prop ourselves up. And these are all just on different places of the same spectrum here. They're not different in kind, right? All of those things are deceit. And we do so uh, perhaps to protect ourselves, and to make ourselves uh, feel important or feel impressive. And sometimes the lies actually work. But inevitably, you know, they'll become a lot to keep up with. And we worry that if people can see through our thinly veiled fabrications, we worry that people might then find out the truth about who we really are. And so deceit compounds upon itself. We have to push it, push it deeper to the point where maybe even we convince ourselves that this is true. But then we become slaves to deceit, right? It will determine what we can say and what we must do in a future life. And what we thought would end up protecting us lies, those things will end up enslaving us. And we can do this with any of the Ten Commandments. You can see the way that they will enslave you were you to break them. If we think freedom means doing anything that we want, anything we want, then we'll find ourselves lustfully pursuing people, whether visually uh, on a screen or physically. But those pursuits, they will not fulfill us. They'll leave you broken. And you'll be enslaved by lustful thoughts and unable to relate to others as people. Or we'll find ourselves just acquiring stuff by any means necessary, hoping to find some sort of freedom and joy in the things that we have. But pursue that desire and you will never be satisfied. Instead, you simply become enslaved by the things we own, unable to even use all of them. Sometimes unable to even maintain them and keep them in good working condition. And it will not work to simply keep some of God's laws. We will not live truly free lives simply by keeping most of the commandments that God gave. The law, it was given to the people as a whole, and it must be taken as a whole. Because this law shows how to live the free life in relation with God and with other people. And so by breaking even only one part of it, that will negate that freedom. So this is why uh, the author James wrote in James chapter 2, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point of it is guilty of breaking all of it. And we are each of us lawbreakers. We are each of us people who would return to our own bondage and slavery because we do not keep covenant faithfulness. And there's only one who didn't return to slavery. There's one who kept perfect covenant faithfulness. One who lived the free life. One who lived out God's vision for his people. How to relate to himself and to others. Jesus Christ, who in Matthew 5 said this of himself. Do not think that I came into this world to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus fulfilled the whole law. He did not abolish it. He did not throw it out or get rid of it or nullify it in any way. He fulfilled it. And he did that perfectly. Now to fulfill, it, it means to bring to completion. To realize something or to, to fully achieve something. And this is what he did. He realized the law. He achieved the full extent of the law. He embodied 
a full realization of what it looks like for the law of God to be lived out in the life of a human. He lived out the purpose of the law by relating to God and to others around him perfectly. And remember what he said when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because all of the law and the prophets, they hang on these two commandments. And indeed, the first four commandments for you to look through them again, they describe how we relate to God. How we love Him. And the remaining six, they describe how we relate to our neighbor. And how we love them. The entire law is summarized in love for God and love for our neighbor. So it's fulfilled by properly relating in love to God and to others. And Jesus did it perfectly. He loved his God perfectly, and he had perfect with union with him. He loved him to the point of obeying his Father's will, even as it led him to die on the cross. And he loved you perfectly. He loved others perfectly, because he willingly climbed up upon that cross, subjected himself to the agony of death on a cross, because he knew that we would never keep the law. We could never do this. We would never be reconciled, as we would never be made right again with our God in relationship with him on our own. And so, since we could not keep it, he kept it on our behalf. And so then the question is, what does this law mean for you and for me today in our own living? We must not reduce the law to simple guidelines. This is not simply a good way for humanity to live. It's not simply some nice sort of foundational principles for even a country to live by. The purpose of the law is not to make you know, the U.S. run smoothly as a society. Again, this is a unique law because this is a law that's for God's people. Now certainly it has benefit for the rest of the world, and were they to see it lived out, they would see a light in the middle of a dark world. But that's not its primary function. John Calvin argued that the primary function of the law now for the Christian is to guide the Christian in appropriate ways to live out gratitude to God for the saving work that he's done. And so if your faith is in Christ alone, and in the saving work that he's done through his life and through his death and resurrection and his ascension, then you live under his banner. You live under his rule. You live within the bounds of his covenant relationship with you. And it's his spirit that he gives to equip us to do so. But it's only when you see that Christ has fulfilled the law for you that you will begin to live it out in gratitude. Only when you truly see that Christ has already fulfilled the law for you, only then will you be able to live that law out in gratitude to him. It's only when you have Christ's spirit that you will not fear the law as something that binds you or something that condemns you. Because in the hands of Christ, the law is the charter for your freedom. Because God's people are those who do not live under the curse of false gods or the fear of lacking or the curse of hate or of lust or the desire for more or deceit or envy or any of those things. And so freedom is not found simply when all rules and all authority have been thrown off. True freedom is not found when we can do anything that we want to do. Instead, it has a direction. True freedom is toward something. And so, friends, may you find that Christ does not wield the law in order to condemn you. Instead, he completed the law to free you. And living in accordance with God's law is the way that we give thanks to him for that freedom. 
And when we live out the free life, our lives will bear witness that our God is still at work in this world through you, through his people. And so may those who are bound to slavery and sin, may they see our love. May they see you live lives that are truly free. And then may we introduce them to the giver of that freedom, Jesus Christ. So all thanks and praise be to our God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you pray with me? Our good and gracious God, we thank you for your word, and while it seems contradictory, we thank you that you give us a law in order to free us. That in Christ you completed this law, and we can now find freedom because of his righteousness. We know that we cannot keep it. We do not keep covenant faithfulness. It does not take long for our hearts as we sum to wander away once again. So Holy Spirit, we pray that you would work within our lives, sanctifying us, making us more like the Son, so that we can express our great, grateful hearts to you through the way that we live. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen.